Welcome everyone. I am Amita Baviskar from the Environmental Studies and Sociology Anthropology Department at Ashoka University. And together with Mike Levian from the Sociology Department at Johns Hopkins Universities, I'm delighted to present this forum on behalf of the Journal of Peasant Studies. Those of you who work on agrarian and rural politics and development know that since the 1970s, JPS has been the leading journal that's provided the sharpest analyses of agrarian change. Many of its earlier articles have become classics, featuring prominently in university syllabi. JPS also encourages new cutting edge research um, in agrarian political economy and ecology from younger scholars. It has activist reflections, as well as debate and discussion on key ongoing events and processes. And one of these debates is today's forum about India's agrarian question. For more than seven months, farmers have encircled Delhi, India's capital, and have vowed to stay there until their demands are met. We're talking about more than 300,000 farmers and their families, their supporters. And they want the repeal, uh, primarily they want the repeal of three farm laws. I won't go into the details, but our panelists will. But it should be noted, this is not the first occasion in recent times that farmers have gathered in such large numbers to protest. Uh, two years ago, more than 600,000 farmers marched um, hundreds of kilometers to Mumbai as part of a mammoth um, Kisan rally in order to protest against the conditions that they were confronting. So the protests are an expression of decades old processes of agrarian transformation. And uh, those are the questions about India's agrarian question that we need to ask today. I will stop there and hand um, the floor over to Mike Levian, uh, who will present, uh, introduce today's panel and the questions we are going to be discussing. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Um, the purpose of this panel on class, caste, and agrarian change is to bring the insights of agrarian political economy to bear on the ongoing farmers' protests. Uh, agrarian political economy, to put it extremely briefly, uh, is a tradition of scholarship that has uh, sought to understand the various historical ways in which capitalism seizes agriculture and the consequences of this for inequality and in politics. Um, so this tradition, sometimes known as the agrarian question, has a long and deep connection to JPS. Uh, and indeed, in the 1980s and 1990s, there were vigorous debates in JPS on the earlier um, kind of wave, the high earlier high water mark uh, of the far India's farmers' protest, which were led by many of the same actors as today. Uh, they were then called India's new farmers' movements. So one of the purposes of this panel is to re revisit those debates uh, and ask, you know, what is new about the current uh, round of farmers' protest, um, besides the, you know, existence of tweets that can be retweeted by Rihanna, um, what 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 is actually new um, about these protests, and how can this tradition of scholarship uh, help us understand them? Uh, with that in mind, we invited three uh, leading scholars of agrarian political economy in India, uh, each of whom has particular expertise on the sociology of class and caste uh, in North India. Uh, to comment on these issues, and we're thrilled that they could join us. So I'm going to introduce them. Satendra uh, Kumar teaches sociology at G.B. Pont Social Science Institute uh, at the University of Allahabad. He works across the fields of sociology and anthropology of caste, class, and agrarian political economy uh, and political anthropology. His research investigates how marginalized groups understand and engage with politics and the state in contemporary India. He has conducted long-term ethnographic fieldwork on these is issues in Eastern and Western uh, UP. His book, Badalta Gaon, Badalta Dehat, Nai Samajikta Kaude, Changing Village, Changing Countryside, The Rise of a New Sociality, was published by OUP Press in 2018. Uh, and so 10 is too modest to uh, add this, but it won several awards. And I understand it's the first book written in Hindi and published in Hindi by the OUP. Um, so Tendra is having some internet problems, so we're hoping he will get those resolved uh, and, and join us in a little bit. Surinder S. Jotka is professor of sociology at JNU in New Delhi. 
Uh, the focus of his research has been on the dynamics of caste in contemporary India, uh, agrarian social change, and the political sociology of community identities. His recent publications uh, include many books, uh, India's Villages in the 21st Century, Revisits and Revisions, edited with Edward Simpson, uh, uh, 2019 on OUP, Mapping the Elite, Power, Privilege, and Inequality, edited with Jules Naudet, uh, also OUP, 2019, a Handbook of Rural India in 2018, uh, Contested Hierarchies, Caste and Power in the 21st Century, uh, Caste in Contemporary India, Caste on OEP uh, 2012. He is among the recipients of the ICSSR Amartya Sen Award for Distinguished Social Scientist. Jens Lurka is Associate Professor uh, in Labor and Agrarian Studies at SOAS, University of London. He works on agrarian relations, labor relations and discrimination and oppression. His main research focus is class caste oppression and work relations between Dalits and landowning uh, communities and Dalit seasonal uh, labor migration. He has researched agrarian development and Jat Thakur Dalit relations in UP since the 1990s. He is the editor of the Journal of Agrarian Change, the other amazing journal on agrarian political economy, um, one of the others. Um, and his recent publications include the jointly authored book, uh, Ground Down by Growth, uh, Tribe, Caste, Class and Inequality in 21st century India, which came out on Pluto and OUP in 2018. Okay, so I'm gonna um, just share the, the, the questions. To provoke discussion, I circulated a few questions to the panelists that were meant only as a prompt or provocation and will not confine their comments, but I will quickly read them um, to you. In the 1980s, uh, this is the first question. In the 1980s and 1990s, India's farmers protest, including by the BKU, were the subject of intense debate in JPS between Marxist and so-called populist. What if anything is different about the current protests and what if anything should be different about the debate today? Second question, what are the major trends of agrarian change that help us understand the causes and character of these protests? The third question, um, what do we know about the social composition, class, caste, gender, and generation of these protests? Four, how do you analyze the laws that provided the direct spark for these protests? And five, in your analysis, what have these protests accomplished and what might be their potential political impact? So the format is that each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I will warn them when they're almost out of time. Uh, based on their comments, I will then pose a few questions back to the panel and generally ask them to respond to each other. Then we're gonna open up to your questions, which I request you put in the chat window. Um, and you can start putting those in the chat window at any point in the discussion, and I will do my best to uh, pose as many of them as possible to our panelists. Okay, so um, that, with that said, um, let's start with uh, Professor Jodka. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Amita and Mike. Uh, uh, JPS, as Amita was saying, uh, when we were students in 1980s, uh, JPS issues were so, so, quote unquote, sacred for us. Uh, JPS and EPW were the two sites where, I mean, almost everything that was relevant, uh, not only to agrarian change, but anything that we thought was relevant was published in these two journals. And later on, uh, obviously, agrarian change was another platform with which we have been kind of engaging and reading and extensively uh, following. So I feel really honored to be part of this discussion. <clears throat> uh, let me, uh, since uh, I think initially when uh, we were communicated, there was also an idea of providing regional contexts. And uh, I've been working on Punjab and Haryana, and that's where, uh, in some sense, these movements uh, started the movement that we are talking about today. So let me kind of locate my presentation uh, uh, in, in the Punjab context and how, uh, at some level, the movement takes off from there and. And I think it's uh, to answer these questions, I think it'll be a good idea to kind of move along with the, with the time uh, as movement kind of uh, uh, progresses because it's an ongoing movement to talk about it itself is kind of sociologically or uh, you know, professionally little kind of uh, haste, but needs to wait and watch and then perhaps try to answer some of these questions. But still, I think we already have plenty of information and idea of what is happening on ground. So these protests start sometime in July, uh, soon after uh, the, the ordinances were passed. Uh, these three farm laws relate to agriculture. They 
I don't want to go in farm laws because that would take up all my 15 minutes. But they basically tried to change uh, the nature of agricultural marketing uh, primarily that, you know, people, uh, the farmers would not really have uh, their own markets, which are Mondays, but will have to at some level uh, negotiate with the larger corporate economy to sell their produces and, and stuff like that. Related to that is also a question of how much uh, can anyone buy, how do they buy and all those things. So these farms laws were initially passed as ordinances uh, by the government of India, central government. Agriculture happens to be a state subject, but the exception was made and somehow these laws were passed under trade kind of act, which is central government's uh, prerogative. But these are laws that relate to agriculture, its commerce primarily, the way it is kind of you know taken out and uh, uh, produced and marketed. So Punjab farmers are, as I would uh, discuss uh, in detail after some time, uh, are primarily uh, commercial producers, they, they produce for market. And so they kind of have uh, an understanding of marketing systems and they, they, they were following these, uh, these, these, these uh, discussions because in one of the meetings, uh, some of the farmers leaders were actually uh, invited and they were not allowed to speak. So they had some idea about what was coming and then they immediately kind of picked up those uh, uh, those those documents, ordinances, and uh, read them and kind of tried to make sense of them. And they were alarmed. And so they started, uh, in some sense, protesting or talking about them uh, uh, right after that in July 2020. Uh, Akali Dal, uh, Sharomni Akali Dal, as it's called SAD, which has been part of uh, NDA, National Democratic Alliance, which is led by BJP for many years, and they are primarily a party of the Sikh uh, uh, community, but primarily in the, in the rural agrarian kind of context. And uh, they were part of the government and when, when, the, when the ordinances were passed, but they figured out that on ground situation was very different and farmers were getting very agitated. So they opposed and tried to tell the government not to go ahead with the, with their enactment, which did not, uh, they did not listen to them. So by September, Akali Dal actually comes out of the party and there was one minister of the Akali party and she resigns from the, from the central government. And on 20th of September, uh, these farm laws were actually passed by Indian parliament. And after the laws are passed, uh, 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 protests pick up in Punjab uh, in September, uh, already they had the jail Bharo Andolan from that is fill the jails and they, they uh, give uh, voluntary arrests that is from September 8th to September 13th. And then uh, uh, the, in the next week uh, from September 14th to September 24th, they tried to block trains in Punjab. So this is around the time when farmers unions begin to coordinate with each other. There used to be one big BKU in 1980s, which had at some level what we were talking about, the new farmers movement 1980s. These were surplus producing rich farmers who got together and they basically protested around the price question. And these protests were very powerful in 1980s and BKU also was very powerful in Punjab, uh, in UP, in Haryana, in, in Gujarat, in some other parts of the country as well. So uh, 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 after the 80s, uh, farmers movements in some sense began to disintegrate in across country and farmers movement, I mean, these so-called rich farmers who were who were beneficiaries of green revolution and they fragmented and these were at that time as uh, jps had conceptualized were new populist in the sense that they talked about rural versus urban in a very homogeneous manner and they represented the rich farmers interests but they claimed to represent the entire rural which included landless laborers and people you know in india 50 percent uh, historically have been landless and, and laboring kind of people so they tried to transcend the idea of class and they spoke in this populist language. So after 1980s, agriculture actually goes into distress in the 90s and post 90s. And somehow this is also the time when farmers politics begins to fragment. And you have uh, uh, in Punjab also, uh, you did not see any kind of major farmers movement after 1980s. There was also this Khalistan movement, even though that ended in early 90s. But even then for many years, even though agriculture was in distress, we uh, continue to hear this news about uh, suicides and occasionally there would be protests, but there were no pan Punjab farmers movement, which was, which was nationally visible or which was reported in some sense, uh, 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 mainly by the national media. So 
uh, you have uh, at some level uh, organizations still working on ground and the organizations that become very strong in the 90s and the first uh, decades of the 21st century are actually the left wing organizations these were not the populist organizations for example uh, you have now around nearly 40 different factions of bku and each of them have their own uh, area where they are active they also sometimes overlap but the most powerful unions that emerge in the malwa region of punjab are uh, movements by uh, by bku ugraha faction bhartiya kisan union union ugraha ugra is name of the village but this leader is also called ugraha so uh, now another aspect of punjabi farmer is that they are nearly all of them are sikhs and nearly all of them are jats so jat is a caste and sikhism is a religion but there are also some other communities who own land the uh, sainis and kambojs but they are not really large landowners most of the big landowners in punjab are jats and jat sikhs also happen to be the regional political elite all the chief ministers of punjab are, for example jat sikhs except for one or two uh, who have earlier been but the current chief minister is also a jat sikh from patiala badals who have been in power for a long time they are also large farmers from malwa region so that kind of was at some level farming lobby in punjab historically has been very very powerful and they were at some level also serving farming interest by by giving them subsidies in various forms like at state level they would give them give them free uh, electricity and left organizations then began to also organize landless laborers and then you know the new kind of kisan mazdoor ekta becomes their slogan where farmers and workers were 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 organized together so in these movements i think uh, there was a kind of turning point because this is the time when they are really alarmed where all their that doesn't mean that you know even though they were being subsidized by the state government agriculture was in distress and that distress begins to then uh, mobilize farmers from from below and then when these acts come they realize that now whatever we have left that will also go go away and the main thing that they were worried about is the support price regime indian government has this support price regime which was put in place uh, uh, at the time of green revolution that if you do, are not able to sell your produce at a particular rate we will buy that produce because government of india ran its uh, public distribution system a uh, food security system through 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 its own kind of systems and they used to acquire both wheat and and and, and paddy from farmers directly through uh, locally instituted marketing centers which are called as mandis and mandis have their own uh, uh, what one should say commission agents who are called artiyas in punjabi so this was kind of alarm signal that now this support price is going to go away and once that goes away then agriculture will become even more difficult and then they begin to coordinate that this was kind of survival question and we need to come together so initially uh, uh, this is uh, basically a movement of the older generation of farmers most of the farmers who 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 sit on these dharnas initially are perhaps 50 plus and those who are kind of older generation interestingly sometime around that time september october the new kind of trend starts in punjab and this is something which is very very important when i think future historians talk about farmers movement they'll take note of it and that was the role of punjabi singers now punjab folk culture has been very very important and most of these singers come either from the jat families or they come from dalit families and most of those who came from jat sikh families they began to mobilize young people that see how older people are sitting on dharnas and you are not bothered about and our existence is in danger and this is the time when at some level they begin to mobilize themselves not only as farmers but also as punjabis as regional identity and also they begin to kind of mobilize around idioms of sikhism and sikh religion and that at some level works very well so there is a kind of uh, uh, what one should say uh, interesting uh, new language that is beginning to be invented in punjab and if you look at the caste class context of punjab it is very interesting 32% of punjabi population uh, is is of scheduled caste and almost all of them are land landless laborers and they have historically been not of not part of farmers movement they actually have always had kind of internal conflict and during green revolution initial years this conflict actually became much sharper but by 1970s you have migrant labor which begins to come from bihar and eastern uttar pradesh and then by 1980s uh, dalit laborers begin to withdraw from agriculture and their the conflict in some sense begins to decline but this conflict again emerges 
more in terms of identity politics, which is a kind of little complicated subject. But the point is that Jats and Dalits are two different blocks in rural Punjab, and they remain separate blocks. And even uh, 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 in the in the in the Khalistan movement, this conflict was very clearly visible. But post 90s, you have the decline of agriculture, and this has continued. As I was saying, this is reflected in farmers farmers committing suicide, but also uh, many of these Jatsiks themselves begin to see agriculture as a losing uh, kind of game, and they begin to diversify. Many of them uh, leave India, they go to Australia, they go to Canada. For example, Canada has now more than 2% of its population uh, of Sikhs. And all the ministers, Canada, I think, has four ministers who are, who are Punjabi Sikhs and one of the leader of opposition party. All of them are, I think, Jat Sikhs. I'm not very sure about it, but I, my own intuition is they're all from rural Punjab. Historically, they have moved from rural Punjab and they were, they were children of agriculturists. And this is reflected in the way they are reacting from different parts of the, parts of the uh, world. Rich among them also begin to diversify into urban business. And one of the business they take up is, 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 is becoming uh, uh, commission agents in, in, in Mondays. So there is a kind of interesting uh, class, uh, uh, what one should say, uh, uh, fluidity that is happening in 1990s. And the kind of conflicts that earlier farmers had on the one hand with Dalits, on the other hand with urban traders who were mostly urban uh, upper caste Hindus, that begins to uh, weaken and you have a new kind of reality where actually number of people who do agriculture, that begins to also come down because farmers are moving out and many of them are exiting agriculture because their holdings have become very small. If you look at, I've just published a piece in the India Forum where I've kind of provided this data. Punjab is a very interesting case. Unlike rest of India, number of small holdings is very small in Punjab. Actually, most of the India, 86% uh, of land holdings are below five acres or two hectares. In Punjab, their number is only 33%. That means 67% of land holdings, I'm not saying these are land ownerships. These are holdings which are based on people who lease in land, those who have left India, they lease out their land to local farmers. So you have uh, uh, nearly 14% in rest of India, but in Punjab, you have much larger number of land holdings, which are, which are, which are much larger in size. These are uh, two acres plus. I suppose Satyendra is not there. I can take two minutes extra if you don't mind. So uh, Punjab agriculture is not simply uh, at some level a peasant agriculture. This is a kind of capitalist agriculture. But the number of people who are engaged in agriculture is also much lesser. Against 41% in India, in Punjab, only 26% of the main male workers who are 15 years above were listed as agriculturists. Some of them would also be, be landless laborers. Now, going back to some of those questions which were which were raised that you know younger people also begin to participate and now there is this saying that 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 older people have wisdom and younger people have energy and this together would be our force of of of, of kind of you know coming to daily and that is how in 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 in, in november uh, last week of november when they begin to march towards daily they are led by the senior people, older people who are leaders of the farmers organizations, but the main strength is provided by younger people. Now, Punjab also has large, uh, educated, unemployed youth who is, who is mostly in rural areas. They could also spare their time and they don't have regular jobs. So they begin to, in some sense, uh, move towards Delhi and then they reach finally in the, in the, now there are nearly four months since they have been sitting on, on the borders of Delhi, something that will get discussed later on. Uh, are these neo-populist movements? Uh, this has been massive mobilization for the last four months. They have continuously gone through various phases, but I will quickly sum up these two questions and then I will stop. Uh, are these new farmers, new, new, new populists? Question, but the price question of inputs and outputs. But I personally feel this is not the new populist movement. I think there is some major shift happening for which we will need to wait to really analyze. And that shift is at two levels. One is for the first time in Punjab, I've heard you have the new slogan of uh, Mazdoor Kisan Ekta, that unity of workers and laborers. So they are recognizing that there is something class, something called laboring class. And that laboring class is being articulated in class terms 
and they recognize that this laboring class is also class of Dalits. And uh, in the present context, they are actually working very hard. Now, every Punjab village has its own, uh, what one should say, organizational process through which they send 10 people every kind of now and then like one week they would go and then next 10 people would get ready. So they're actually mobilizing the whole village. They're taking chanda, the money from everyone. So they actually go and these are all led by Jat Six, but they go to Dalit households. They request them for chanda. They request for them for money. And then they also request them. I'm underlining the word request. Request them to be part of the part of the group. And they actually are coming. Dalits are also coming. So it's not exclusively Jat, but it is led by Jat. But more importantly, they realize that this is something which is bigger than the question of agriculture. It's also a question of larger uh, politics of the country. So their enemy is also not the urban trader. Their demand is also not better prices. Their demand is actually more structural where they are identifying corporate capital as trying to capture agriculture and turn them into, 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 into landless and the land would eventually go to, you know, Ammani Adani as that has become slogan. And also very interesting kind of thing that we have seen during these protest movements, major mobilization of women. And some of them are very, very articulate women. And there are many women, and particularly in BKU Ugraha, which is kind of sitting on Tikri border. They are, they are, they are actually very, very articulate. And they, the other day, they had 70,000 women present uh, at the Tikri border. Day for yesterday was, was, was anniversary of Bhagat Singh's Shahidi, uh, his, his martyrdom. Now, Bhagat Singh was a kind of leftist, even though himself came from Yat family. But the way it was celebrated by everyone, so there's a new language of left, which in some sense is with what I call the language of Sikhi, Sikhis, Sikhism. And, and, and even uh, BKU Ugraha, which is a left organization, they would say that our main ideological gurus are Bhagat Singh and Guru Nanak, and they kind of come together, and then they obviously have their own left-wing ideology. But the main Sikhism also, they have picked up certain kind of traditions which talk about unity of humanity, right? You know, uh, and, and, and looking up, looking forward, Sarbadda Bhala, and there are langars going on. So institutionally, Sikh institutions have played a very, very active role. And the second role that has been played very actively, I wanted to show you some songs, but you can you can kind of you know go to YouTube and just look for Kamar Grewal and his song Elan, where he actually makes a kind of request to everyone and to come together and 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 march to Delhi. And this has already 12 million views. And there was another song which was sung by this other chap when 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 Rihanna tweeted and there was some controversy and they adopted Rihanna as the daughter of Punjab. And suddenly again, this song had like 500 million views within just two, three days. So I've just last one or two minutes that the Sikhi idiom is, is again, a very important part of this movement, which is, which is using Sikhi music, Punjabi music, uh, uh, Sikhi religious music very actively. And they, that is working everywhere. And that something gives them spirit also. And the, those flags, and when they march to Delhi, they mobilize everything from their, from their religious tradition which they could mobilize. You would have seen these blue turban wearing Nihang Singhs who are not necessarily have anything to do with farming, but that was symbolism that we are all together as Sikhs, as farmers, as Punjabis, as Indians. So they didn't have any anxiety about, but they, they were called as Khalistani separatists, but they did not really feel apologetic about it. They continue to use that, that Sikhi slogan. And uh, <coughs> I think I'll stop here uh, since uh, we can come back to it if there are some questions. But I think uh, uh, the, the, the language of Sikhi also enables them to transcend question of caste and question of, uh, at some level, other division that they have in Punjabi. And but they are the, the Sikhi is presented as an as an inclusive idiom which includes everyone. It is not doesn't mean that now when Takayat becomes part of the movement, he's also wearing a Sikh green turban. And he is very happy about it. So they are not really seeing themselves as, as being sectarian Sikhs, but they are kind of using the Sikhi idiom to include everyone where it some sense becomes something else. It is, it is not that they are not recognizing class. They are recognizing the reality of class, but they are not really, uh, uh, in some sense, shying away from it. And they are insisting on, on uniting. They are recognizing the reality of patriarchy. And actually, they are saying, now see these men who are sitting on dharnas, they are learning to cook. 
and it is going to make life easier for the old women at home. And they are now going to go back and overcome their patriarchy. So they're identifying all these moments. Similarly, question of ecology is being talked about how we were never consulted when Green Revolution was introduced and we are now suffering because of that. But at the same time, we don't really have a choice. Sorry for taking two minutes extra, but I wanted to say everything that, that I had on my notes. Insightful. Thank you, Professor Jodka. Um, and I'm going to hand it now over to Professor Lurka. Thanks, thanks, Mike, and th thanks, Mike, and uh, Amita for organizing this and for for Journal of Peasant Studies. It's uh, I was very much looking forward to it, and and I must say that uh, listening to Sorenda, it's a, uh, it has already given me more than than I could have hoped for, more understanding. So great. Uh, it's true, as as Mike said, that I have worked in in West UP in Musafanaga district uh, for many years, actually in, in villages close to Sisoli, the headquarters of, of of the BKU, and have had the pleasure of meeting uh, the Tikites many times over the years. But uh, what I'll do today is 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 very much a, a, a sort of a. a, a the presentation one step removed because I am removed. I sit in London, uh, and uh, 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 yes, yeah, so so that is what I can do. Uh, now, the, the, uh, when we're looking at, at the protest, uh, it's it's clear that that it is a struggle against uh, agribusiness and uh, and against the full marketization of agriculture and all the impacts that that would follow from that. I think the surrender outlined that very well. Um, importantly, it, is, it has also become a, a, a central element of the struggle against uh, India's autocratic Hindu fun fundamentalist government. And I think that matters as well if we are to understand the struggle uh, and who engages in it. Um, and if we look beyond those main issues, according to some at least, it is also a struggle for the 40 to 50 percent of the agricultural population that are Atlantis laborers, because even they themselves, the organizations are arguing that if uh, agriculture becomes uh, 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 taken over by agribusiness, then there will be less work for them because they will mechanize, so they will lose the jobs that they do have in agriculture. And finally, there are also those that argue quite reasonably, I think, that if if the, this marketization does set itself through or are being pushed through, then in the long run, it will also be very difficult to maintain the existing system of uh, cheap food being available for sale or for, uh, at, at, at subsidized prices across India, uh, because that comes from purchasing through the, uh, the regulated markets. So in that sense, uh, this struggle has even wider consequences potentially for the, the, the population of India. So overall, the struggle against uh, the, the, the farm laws clearly can be seen as progressive struggles. Um, that said, we, we need to understand the class character of the struggles. That is certainly my view. We need to look at who will benefit the most from these struggles, who won't benefit a lot, who won't benefit at all, who leads it, who's against it. Um, and let me just say that taking up these issues is a different way of thinking than compared to the new populist strand that uh, Mike mentioned uh, from uh, at the beginning, because they would say it is the population, it is, it is, it is the people against, against capital and not analyze the different strands of the people and thinking through what what the different interests in, involved are here. I think it's important to do. So if, if, I, if I should sketch what that would involve, because it can't be anything else but a sketch here. Um, of course, it is true that at the general level, all oppressed caste and class groups in India would benefit for the fall of the BJP government. For, uh, that in a sense make the struggle progressive in general. Um, if we look at them more specifically in relation to the farm laws, then um, it is, it, well, the, the ones that are losing out are the farmers. Who are the farmers? Well, the capitalist farmers and their pity commodity producers that work within capitalism uh, using the capital they have, the land, the, the tools, as well as the labor within the family and, and outside. Um, they will lose out. Um, they will do so in my view, all of them, and this is a, an ongoing di discussion, but one has to, 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 to remember that 
in India, the, the, the link between output prices for agricultural produce and the food prices for consumers uh, is broken, luckily, in the sense that uh, uh, because of the public distribution system, one uh, or Indian consumers, particularly uh, the poor, but uh, I think it's 66% of the population, according to a, a recent survey, have got access to free or subsidized food. And that means that farmers, any farmer that sell uh, his or her produce uh, can buy cheaper food elsewhere as well to live off. So the connection between uh, the, the output prices and the food prices doesn't exist so clearly uh, in India. And so any nets, any sellers of, 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 of agricultural produce will benefit from uh, a system where there are regulated prices. Uh, it is not so that that leads to higher prices for, for the consumers directly. Um, um, so that means, and that is maybe interestingly, that, 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 that uh, it might be that big farmers will benefit the most for the struggle against, against uh, uh, um, uh, the farm laws, but everyone that, ex that, that are farmers in a place where, this, where, the, where the regulated mandis are in place will benefit. It is so that regulated mandis are not in place, regulated markets are not in place all over India. So, so there's a difference there. Um, and that means that is also why one of the demands of the movements is, uh, is to, to move towards a, a fully, a full system across India of regulated demands. So one can say that potentially all farmers across India would lose uh, if the farm laws go through. Interestingly, if we draw the, the parallel back to the old movements of, of the 1980s, early 90s, then I, I would actually argue that it's wrong to argue that, that, that those movements were, were big farmers' movement. Uh, as far as I can see, even back then, all farmers benefited for the demands that were made by the movements, including for higher prices for, um, uh, for produce, inclu including for lower e e electricity prices. So these were movements where all pity commodity producers and capitalist farmers would benefit. Uh, of course, um, agricultural laborers would not, but all farmers would. And that is a point that where, where I may be at odds with, with other people working, uh, with many other people working at, at the old movements. Um, today, looking at the movements, um, it's clear as uh, Surinda outline as well that it involves big capitalist farmers. It also in, involves small farmers, uh, particularly outside Punjab. It is very clear that, that, that the contingents of, of, of farmers that are taking par part in the movement from West and, and Central India uh, involves many more small farmers than uh, the ones from the North and even involve Adivasi farmers, uh, so indigenous tribal people, uh, farmers from from those regions of India. Uh, the Jats, uh, which is the other big uh, uh, the, the, um, the parts of, of, the, uh, of the contingents of, of farmers from, from West UP, they are mixed bunch, big farmers, small farmers. But be, be that what it may, in my view, uh, getting the, the, the farm loss off the table will benefit all farmers, some more than others. Um, the farm laws have also clearly shown to the farmers uh, uh, that the BJP government is on the side of, uh, of big corporate capital. The multi-billionaires of Adanis and, uh, and Ambanis, as he said, so big traders, big trading companies, those are the ones that will benefit for the opening up of the sector to, to, to agribusiness and traders. And in the grand scheme of things, farmers matter very little to the government. And that has been brought home uh, through through these farm laws, I think, and that, in my view, is the major political change that have enabled the protests. That um, that uh, farmers have become aware that uh, the government really do not uh, will not look after their interests, and this is an important change. If we look at the Jad farmers in uh, from West UP. Let us not forget that it, they have been supporting the BJP government to the hilt for the last 20 years at least. It's not more than eight years ago that the BJP and Jad activists together instigated a riot against Muslims in, in, in Mustafanagar district in West UP. That has all changed. So major political changes here. 
Um, what about the landless groups? Well, uh, potentially they, they will, as, as outlined before, uh, lose out if these laws are going through and therefore potentially there's an argument for why they, why they should support the action. Um, and uh, uh, that said, of course, I'm also well aware that, that farmers do oppress and exploit local Dalits as well as seasonal migrant workers of which some are Dalits, some are Adivasi, some are other lower caste. Uh, and that that is going on. There's work going on in Punjab as late as, 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 as this summer. There were reports that local panchayats of, of farmers decreed that wages should be lowered for the Dalit laborers. So that there are class conflicts within, within, within village society. Uh, but it is interesting that in spite of that, we are seeing some support, uh, some noticeable support from da for uh, from Dalit movements uh, uh, for the for the for the struggle against the, against the farm laws. Um, now, um, why is why why is this happening? Why have are there these unities? Why uh, is there this political change uh, in, in what farmers? Uh, how, how farmers perceive the, the government. I think firstly, if we're looking at, at the structural level, firstly, it's important to, 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 uh, to see that uh, what I've called the bypassing of the agrarian question of, of capital is still ongoing. That uh, uh, capital in India, the ruling classes in, in India have no need for capital to uh, provide, uh, have no need for farmers to, provide capital that could be invested in other sectors. The classic idea of how uh, uh, economic development took place, where, where uh, 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 capitalist development of agriculture was central for the development of capitalism elsewhere. India has bypassed this. India has gone straight for international finance capitalism and do not need their farmers. Farmers do not play a significant role in what matters for the ruling classes economically. Um, Therefore, they can, well, governments do not have to look after them very directly. On top of that, of course, uh, so it is classical in, uh, uh, in uh, as the economy develops, more and more people have to shift, shift out of agriculture because it is not viable in the long run uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to run a, a, a continuously more mechanized agriculture with the same amount of people. Uh, and that is happening, certainly. Farmers cannot live off agriculture uh, in India alone. They haven't been able to do that for at least 20 years. Um, everyone, nearly everyone, has a non-agricultural employment as well. Um, and that, that so, so we're not talking about farmers versus other groups. We're talking about a new category of, of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of of farmers come laborers outside of agriculture. And with regards to landless laborers, we are also talking in the same manner of a class of laborers that are certainly not purely and often not primarily agricultural laborers. We also have to be very well aware of the way class and, and, and caste are inex inextricably linked in this. One cannot understand uh, class relations in India without understanding that. Um, it, it, that is also the case when we are talking, well, that is about landlessness and land, Dalits are landless, dominant farming castes are the main, uh, are the main landowners, but also in the manner that the transition out of agriculture takes place. The jobs you get differ depending on whether you are Dalit or whether you are a, a farmer. The class differences are maintained. Final ingredients is that India is now uh, in its overall economy experiencing uh, job loss growth, if it is experiencing growth at all. That, that there's simply the, 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 the jobs available outside of agriculture are becoming fewer and fewer. It is, it is it, uh, the, 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 portion of the number of jobs outside of agriculture have been falling in the last year. It's unheard of. Uh, and that means that uh, there is a crisis uh, there's a job crisis for rural people trying to find jobs elsewhere. That means more rural people have to stay within agriculture. Uh, so 
the crisis, in my view, is not primarily within the agricultural sector. It is a crisis of the economy that hasn't been able to produce a kind of economic uh, growth that, that has created the jobs, the good jobs necessary outside of agriculture. And therefore, those that would, had that been the case, have moved out of agriculture, have to stay. That means, of course, that incomes uh, within agriculture are under pressure. It is not primarily because within agriculture, uh, uh, the, the, the income per farmer is falling. It has been low for a very long time, but it is the, 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 the extreme that has happened in the last five, six, seven years is this job crisis that, that puts extra pressure on, 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 on the rural populations. Um, now I can see my time is, is, is already getting short. So let me, let me just uh, 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 try and say a few more words on uh, the, the white, the extreme uh, or the fantastic uh, manner in which this uh, protest uh, has managed to encompass so many different groups. It is, it is, it is the case as Sorenda outlined in, in, in relation to Punjab, but in more general as well, that uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the protest action has reached out and has got support from and are supporting uh, uh, labor unions, general strike in November, informalized labor, remember, uh, 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 the activist that was jailed, that, was, that got the full uh, wrath of the farmers movement uh, behind her and the Dalit activist groups uh, in Punjab, in, in, in UP, such as, uh, as uh, um, uh, the Bima Army in UP, that, that was the first group to, to, to uh, was one of the groups that reinforced um, uh, uh, a farming or, or the, the tickite when, well, the, this becomes too detailed actually, but, but, but they were very involved in, in, the, the, in, in supporting uh, the Jad say, the Jad UP section of the, of the movement at, at a certain stage. Now, I think to understand why this has happened, we have to again uh, start with the overall uh, political situation and economic situation in India. Farmers' movements have simply realized that in order to win, they need total unity, much beyond themselves. They have realized that the government will not give in easily. You need a broad-based move movement to win. And that guides its strategy, both among farmers and, and, and beyond that. Um, the, the governments have stopped giving out SOPs to farmers as they did as they did in the 90s. Now it's big business that counts, not farmers, and, and you have to adjust to that as a movement. Uh, so, uh, and they've done some fantastically well. I mean, the, 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 the Surinder explained it in relation to Punjab. Elsewhere, we have seen the All Indian Kisan Sabha from from. 2014 onwards, mobilizing broad, uh, uh, even uh, bringing out support for um, Dalits when atrocities were committed against Dalits, uh, uh, defending Adivasi right there. They're, they're pushing the boat for what farmers' movements do quite dramatically. Um, and it is very interesting to see how they do that, consciously creating new alliances. To me, that is for political reasons, and, and of course also the politics of, of the leadership is, 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 is different from what used to be the case, but it is an, an analysis that says we have to do this in order to win. And that is why it can get backing also from more, uh, uh, from elements uh, of farmers movements that used to certainly would have nothing to do with Dalits that they look down upon. They see now that this kind of unity is necessary. It is perfect, there's a perfect strategy to, unite all groups that are alienated by the Modi regimes. And that is what they're trying to do. Um, now, um, so in my view, this is not the cause because of a, of, a, of, a, of a natural change in the class base within farmers. It is not because we now have all of a sudden only marginal uh, farmers that are, feel close to, to the laborers. They don't. They will, uh, any farmer that has land and will employ labor belonging to, a, and if they belong to, to the dominant farming caste, will not want to, to uh, they are in an objective uh, conflict with their labors and they're, then they're, they're in a caste conflict with their labors too. That hasn't stopped, but they've seen it is necessary to ally as much as possible. Now, I do know I'm, I'm, I'm running uh, over. So let me just say, um, uh, this is very interesting, very positive. It, it is 
one should also not sort of uh, think this is the end of conflicts within this group that are now allied. And that is again why difference to a more populist perspective shows itself. Uh, to me, this is a contingent phase of alliances between groups that in many ways have different interests. But on these particular points we're talking about here, they do have interests that are similar enough for them to, to ally. Uh, I would not expect farmers to stop trying to put pressure on dotted laborers uh, wages. I would not expect uh, uh, atrocities to stop, et cetera, et cetera, because of this. But I, I, I would, and, and sadly, uh, I think the history is that, that when, when movements have gone, uh, when, when the dominant part of a movement gets what it wants, it forgets the, the promises it has given to others, land reforms in India, Dalits didn't benefit. Uh, I mean, there's a history here, and I, I worry that we'll see this again. But that said, what's happening right now is, is clearly to the benefit of all the groups that are involved, and it's great to see. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, so I believe Professor Kumar is having some trouble with uh, the internet and might join us via phone through Amita's feed. Yes, okay. Uh, you're muted, Amita. Sorry. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, Satendra, you're on. Yes, uh, so I I think that just, uh, just give me a second. I'm trying to connect if possible. I think that it seems the uh, net is back. And so just give me a second, otherwise then I'll start. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so give me a second. And if it doesn't work. Great, then, fine. Yes, we'll just we'll wait start. for you to get on. Otherwise this phone call is open anyway. And I'll just use the time to say that people can start uh, put, there's some people started putting their questions in the Q&A. So um, if, uh, as they occur to you, um, participants can start putting their, their questions, um, which we will uh, get to as many of, of those as we can. Um, Digital revolution in India. Sorry, Satyendra, so, please start again because I've muted my mic. Please start again. Okay, so uh, let me start. I think that should be easy. Could, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, uh, Mike. Is it is it clear? It's it's okay. Um, I think we can make it out. Um, but if there's anything more we can do to amplify it. Be yeah, I'm actually I'm using an external speaker and hoping that that makes it clearer. Yeah, I think go so, ahead. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll... Sorry, go ahead, Satendra. Start. So uh, first, my apologies because I have no control over this uh, internet, and uh, I am one of the perfect example of uh, uh, digital revolution in India, uh, as one of the farm ministers stated very clearly today in go to, to electronic trading and the seamless market. But it, it seems it's not working. So let, let me begin with uh, uh, with Western UP. And uh, I will begin, uh, I, I know previous speakers have uh, very, very you know, thoroughly have explained the situation and, and the farmer composition of this movement and uh, these many specificities, what is going on. So there will be some overlap also, and there will be uh, something uh, I will try to uh, bring a new point. So bear with me, please, because of this whole uh, internet and the uh, phone maps. Uh, let me begin first with the class and the caste character of this movement. Uh, protest which is going on, and and I'll begin, uh, I'll begin with the detailed history a little bit so that we get uh, what, hap what is happening in Western UP. Uh, and so BKU as a, uh, it has been the umbrella organization, though it was dominated by Jats and Balian plan, and it started in 1970. It has been an organization whose in the 70s and 80s, uh, 
gain popularity internationally and particularly in cities where it's launched like a uh, farmer protest and uh, their famous post club Rally in Delhi, which has been existing uh, in the memory of people and keep talking how come that huge uh, crowd of farmers entered in Delhi and it's still uh, this kind of images and memories is still talked about for the DKU and Mahendra Singh Sikhet and when his son was sort of his emerge a legion, Rakesh Sikhet, though he was the spokesperson of the DKU. So a little bit about uh, the DKU, as we know, it is a sort of a family and clan organization which emerged in a small village fully and expanded and um, expanded throughout Western UP and also has a reach to Punjab, Haryana and Eastern UP also. But it, it still seems like a very, very family uh, and uh, dynastic organization when after Mandar Singh died, then his son, two sons, took over, Naresh Tikas, who has been our president, and Rakesh Tikas became a spokesperson. As already Jain has pointed out, uh, then in few years, BPU has been very close relation with the BJP. But very interestingly, in seven, uh, in 80s, it was such a umbrella organization, and uh, uh, it, it gave platform across caste and classic. And here I mean, class here, my, uh, uh, it was interesting that the small farmer, jack small farmer, and of course the uh, big, big jack farmer in 80s, they came, they were able to come together under the umbrella of EK as one. But also interestingly, there was other farmers, other farmers like Uyghur, and uh, Shepherds or veterinary, as you can call them, or sort of Rajputs also. So there are other caste groups. So those who belong to small and big farmers, they were also working under Mandar Singh Tikhar or under the umbrella of Bikin. That was how successful it has been. And the famous slogan of Allah Akbar or Mahadev well, has been romanticized and well written and documented by Dipankar Gupta and other other uh, other commentators that how uh, when the BKU had protested in Meerat and vote club, this slogan of Hindu Muslim unity has become a very important uh, uh, marker of this movement or farmers movement and that's why it emerged very powerful in Western Unity because it could bring Muslim farmers also into the fold and gave respectful positions like one of the uh, biggest leaders who has joined again and I'll come back to again to the details of it who was a close uh, ally of Mahindra is Mr. Jola and so uh, similarly there are some Rajput leaders who are very close to Mahindra Sikhar there were Gujars who were very close to Mahindra Sikhar so somehow it is being a family and that uh, and, and clan oriented, uh, clan based organization could bring farmers across caste, class, and religion. And that was a strength which in 18 uh, we can present it. And it was very, very uh, uh, mythological also the, uh, the presence of BKU in Western UP. I'm sure. Uh, like Jane can tell all these uh, stories because he has come to, to Sisoli. Like uh, bureaucrats and police could not dare to enter to the villages and and they provided a very, very, uh, and they imagined the village republic and where the bureaucracy was not allowed. They could get, they could press the government to get cheap electricity or free electricity or, and, and, Harassment of the police were almost uh, almost gone down, but that was a story in the 80s, and it was a story also before the Hujan Samaj Party came into the picture. It was also because it, it was the same time, sort of similar time, 
uh, and but obviously there was also period when jazz and Dalit conflicts were on right. So on the one hand, there was a story of this uh, umbrella organization which could bring small and big farmers, also other caste groups into uh, uh, and, and religion into the fold, but it could not serve or could not provide the same kind of uh, equal uh, equality or security to landless farmers or seamen. And there's a big hole here, actually. So nobody talks about it, and I think the literature has not done. There were the large groups of the MBC here, and uh, not much written on that. Uh, either we talked about the Dalits, or we talk about the landing OBC, actually. But the real uh, uh, stick in the last 30 years has been happened, the rise of most backward caste, actually, and who, who has been largely females or marginal caste. And, and this, this is how the twisted and, and how changed the picture of the Western UP of the rise of these caste group economies. So anyway, uh, uh, this is sort of a big picture. And, and BKU, as a umbrella organization, continues. But when BJP starts is rising, so the dramatic change, I'll go uh, uh, briefly and then uh, I can come back in the QA session uh, if you have more questions. Then in, uh, in 2013, there was a famous Mujahidinagar riot happened and uh, the Jewish literature has emerged around an accused displacement of Muslims or as well as Hindus also happened. And obviously, in that BKU, all the ticket brothers played a very important role. And then the new identity, which is a farmer's identity, started shifting. And more, more sort of Hindu identity emerged in, in, during that period or before. In fact. But it, it's not just a particular moment, but it's already, I have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, there was already in throughout the 80s and 90s. Simultaneously, there was a Canadian transformation which was happening and setting the non farm occupation was emerging and, and farmers' unity was getting weaker. Or it's not withering, but it's sort of a, it was no longer become a uh, pride to become a, a farmer. It was not like when the big things when farmers are protecting and both clubs, there was such a romanticization of farmers, their language, their body style, their clothes, their eating. The sense of plentiness was there, and the people look at them as an issue. So, so, and that sort of thing, I, I think, started declining with the new liberalization, where land holdings become smaller, and 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 the agrarian crisis uh, become deeper because production becomes segment. Farmers could not. Uh, can you see? I, I don't know. It's interesting. Can you see? Sorry, what? Okay. I don't know. I think it's kind of thing. Anyway, so yeah. sorry, I just closed the track. So uh, this whole uh, thing in the uh, 2000s was weakened the farmer's identity. And also more because uh, uh, when a younger generation was not able to find a lucrative job, uh, I mean, uh, uh, sustainability, uh, viable sustainability, or, uh, you know, the, 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 the loss the uh, uh, stagnation of production and income becomes uh, uh, smaller. So then the new generation started looking for a job uh, outside agriculture. And so simultaneously, two processes were going on. On the one hand, the agriculture was on decline income and land holding becomes smaller and, and production stagnated. Inputs become uh, very expensive and subsidy declined. So on the then the young generation they went uh, to look for the jobs in NCR or other areas. And, and so what has happened finally? So, <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Satendra so, is online. So should I end this call, Satendra? I think so. That we still work. We still hope.
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Very nice. I'm so happy you could join. I'm so happy also. It was such a disaster and, uh, you know, suddenly this disappeared. So, uh, I, okay, so uh, this is very nice. And thank you so much again. This is bearing with me. So I will continue now with yeah, where I, I left. But then we give you a little, a little extra time. So, you know, take your time and say what you want to say and um, we'll make up for it later. Of uh, BKU, how BKU at a certain moment was able to bring uh, 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 different class and caste together, but how it's withered away with the whole rise of uh, non farm economy and the young people or a new generation went out from the village of the farming was no longer uh, uh, was either desired or romanticized those people who are doing the work in Delhi is a, uh, a new consumption patterns emerge and it's a new total new economy when you look around the NCR or Haryana and Gurgaon or Noida was working here the farmer's son was working in a low end jobs and they were not looked at uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, respectfully the kind of pride they have in their villages. So very interesting, they wanted to uh, found a new identity other than farmers. And here, here I think the crux lies where, why BJP or the, uh, 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 could make a space. And, and the, then I'm just cutting short that, uh, uh, that story, but I, I want to come 2013 when this riot uh, broke and then this, uh, social uh, uh, fabric of Western UP uh, kind of torn apart. And uh, and this is the very moment when uh, this uh, uh, Muslim leaders or Muslim farmers who are working with BKU, they also withdrew and this uh, and Jola started a new uh, organization, which is a Kisan Mazdoor Sangathan withdrew. And there was a panchat took place and they requested Jola, look, you should withdraw because the Tikai brothers were uh, somehow was part or part, uh, uh, part of this whole panchat, which was uh, organized against uh, a particular community. So they should uh, uh, withdraw from the uh, this uh, uh, Bharti Kisan Union. So th that set into very, very interesting. And as Yen has already uh, pointed out, the, uh, the BKU history then becomes sort of that, they, they become ally of the BJP over the years. Uh, but what happened, so this is, this is the history uh, story of uh, 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 how the uh, how different caste groups were together but how uh, the over the years they the farmers polity could not hold them together they, they this this they sort of uh, uh, separated but interestingly as we all know uh, or i'm trying to point out and uh, in january 28th uh, or 29th whatever happened in gajipur border and this is another story very interesting about the farming movement. Look, as already pointed out by uh, uh, previous uh, uh, panelists, the movement has be, uh, be, began with Punjab, then it traveled to Delhi. And after Delhi is very interestingly how it moves to hinterlands of Punjab, uh, sorry, in UP and, and Haryana. And now in the sort of third phase, the movement has gone out to the uh, gone out to, uh, different cities across country farmers leaders are traveling trying to organize meetings convincing and it's become a quite an umbrella again is gaining uh, umbrella sort of uh, uh, organization is expanded and different uh, generations older and new generation and young people are coming back so come back to again again western up and this incident uh, when the police was clamped uh, down or trying to do that and uh, Tikat uh, uh, Rakesh was a spokesperson. He uh, broke down, and that images of his circulated. Here is a very interesting role of media members. And this, uh, as soon as this uh, uh, this video was circulated and reached to the villages, you could not imagine thirty thousand people gathered in Sisoli around his house in like almost half an hour. That was an amazing thing how the uh, people were got emotional across Western UP and they start in the night they started 
you know, uh, arriving in Gajipur border, immediately uh, uh, Ajit Singh, uh, the uh, RLD also, uh, the leader of the RLD also called Tiket and there are all several JAT leaders started. But it is interesting. And it, that was the moment also BKU started calling uh, its uh, Muslim collaborators or Muslim farmers leaders who were working with them. And the next day there was a huge, uh, the panchat took place in Mujafanagar. And, uh, and uh, the, the platform was shared by uh, Muslim leaders and other caste members also. That is interesting. It's not only just religion, but other caste like Rajputs and 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 and, uh, and, and Shepherd caste. Uh, there's some of the other caste leaders also joined, and that was the where it seemed that something different has uh, something emerged. So despite all the history of communalism, uh, then but this moment could bring uh, the jat farmers across class uh, and, and the other caste and Muslim farmers together. And that, that was a very, very uh, interesting thing. And here I would like to uh, uh, go that it is not, um, so what is interesting it makes about this movement in Western UP, what is, the, what is happening? It's not only bring caste, class, and religion together, but also bringing urban and rural together. And that is the, uh, this, the, the my, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this claim is ties with that, the, uh, the, the, uh, the new populist movement on where, uh, what was the, uh, what is happening in 1980s and what is happening now. So it's, it's a crucial difference. This movement, farmers movement does not romanticize uh, the division between Bharat versus India. In fact, the new generation, which is working in in, uh, in different cities, and uh, uh, they uh, still feel that they should support this movement because they are losing back and not only actively participating, using their skills and network uh, to strengthen the movement. And that is why it was possible over a night, 30, 40,000 farmers from uh, Western UP, rural Western UP could reach to Gajipur border immediately because there was the, these boys or young people who were working in Noida, Gajabad, NCR, Haryana, they were the young blood and, and they, they felt the threat on their identity as a jat, but also as an identity of farmer. The, suddenly they realized identity which they lost, which was denigrated in the city like Delhi, where people look uh, down upon you, you, you don't, uh, you, you don't go to the, uh, you know, you, you don't belong to the cultural uh, rich uh, or, or elites or where you can talk, you don't have a language even to talk. How to speak in, in a sort of a uh, Delhi University or GNU, or how to speak to in front of the people who speak English? So sort of or, or in a middle class circles or in a in a firm where they are working people, there is always device of how 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 you speak, uh, how you speak, how you uh, wear clothes. So this sort of a, a, a robbing of dignity or dispositions of your your. Uh, uh, you know, dignity was uh, part of also, and then they started. Th this was a moment when they thought this is to regain their, their their identity. So this youth started pouring in, into this uh, Gajipur border. Uh, so that was the reason how, and it's not only the youth of Jats. This is also interesting part. If we look at the, as Professor Jodhka also had pointed out, the uh, there are different. Uh, uh, youth from a different caste and classes have also joined. And this is how they identify with the farming because that also gives sort of a respect and dignity. So youth are coming to that. Rural urban uh, divide has come uh, over religion and caste. It's also strengthened the Jata identity that I was trying to say. And I was trying to say, it's not a uh, purely uh, rich uh, and, and the final in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, text, which I'm adding, it's not uh, so. It's a class uh, supported by, of course, there is a, uh, uh, farmers, but there, as we know, the data, and it's a uh, agriculture census of 2014-15, uh, uh, tenth, tenth, tenth census they have given uh, this. Uh, data which tells 90% of the land holdings are either smaller or marginal. And that is also true about Western UP. So these farmers who are protesting, who are out, 
they are the farmers who are having holding between three to five acres, not more than that. Very, very few or very small section of the farmers uh, have a, more than 10 acres of land. So this is a uh, sort of then how it's not just about the uh, uh, one could not say just it's about the rich farmer. They, they are not. I think they're the, as I have pointed out, the middle farmers or I would say call them middle class farmer, the middle class uh, emerged in, in 90s and 2000, and which was supported from the urban income. One needs to also uh, learn this aspect, how the middle class of the rural middle class has been uh, shaped by remittances and urban income. And here, this again, we need to reconceptualization of the rural and urban again and again i'm trying to say so so the how so that what the new social movement uh, which was 1980s uh, or they were called about just a uh, price or uh, uh, you see about demanding a, a very particular very particular uh, set of demands subsidies and that movement emerged in a very different context when there was sort of of course the crisis began it was not uh, the crisis began, but they were still prosperous. Thirty years ago, uh, they, they were in, they were doing better. But today, the movement is when it's said is a deep crisis, and this is a different sort of mobilization which is happening in the crisis when it's about more, uh, as as previously pointed out, it's about more multinational, corporate. Very very clearly, uh, these demands has been articulated. And one, uh, so it's about corporate, and and this is a very interesting point. The farmers is still hesitant to talk about the corporate because they don't know how to navigate the corporate capital. They don't know how to handle and the multinational farmers very well equipped even today to handle with political class, with politicians. And as uh, previously pointed out, like how in Punjab, some of the political parties immediately uh, you know, resigned and then uh, they started um, uh, supporting farmers' women. And the similar case is in the Western UP or UP also, there is a political leader who started supporting. But, but how to, so fa farmers still have not been able to figure out the corporate. Okay, and so last, uh, so last uh, uh, point uh, uh, I will conclude. Uh, uh, what are the implications uh, of the rural uh, uh, ruling dispensation here? And I think that is a, uh, uh, I, so of course it's a very, very interesting. Uh, one thing is very mm, pertinent if the kind of alliances has emerged across generations, caste, class, there also fault lines exist. So it's not so straightforward these, uh, 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 this, uh, this unity or this solidarities, which are, I mean, they are also fragile. And the ruling uh, dispensation is very tactful and that's their, their, their very, uh, they're astute or uh, they have the tactics, they have acquired this skill over the years. They put one caste to another against putting the groups against each other. So this will depend on then how the groups like MBCs who has been a very crucial support for BJP or Gujars like group who, who, uh, who become a very powerful in Western UP, they could uh, support BJP. So if the this, uh, this whole alliance is continued and the fissure does not uh, emerge, I think it's a great potential to change the political equation in North India. I will end here. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Okay, so in the interest of uh, getting into as many questions as possible uh, from participants, I'm going to uh, not pose my own questions. So what I'm thinking I'll do is um, go through a few of these. I'm, I'm seeing some, I'm going to group these. I'm seeing some kind of common themes come up. So what I think is maybe let's take about three of those, and then I'm going to put those back to the panelists. And then in responding, the panelists can also respond to anything that uh, the other panelists uh, said, because there were some synergies and I think some subtle and agreement, but uh, but some maybe subtle differences um, in 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 what they said. Um, so one of the things that's coming up uh, in many of the questions is back to the question of alliances between sort of richer farmers and, and laborers. Um, so there's a few different questions uh, about this. And 
let's see some some are asking for definitions of that um but let's see i you know just sort of sum up a few of these um I think Mr. Shaker, um, uh, Sabina also says, given the nature of the conflicts between these two classes, um, what is the motivation of laborers to participate um, in these protests? And you know, especially um, Dalit laborers in Punjab. Um, I think uh, Samantha has a similar question. Um, I was very interested in what Dr. Jotka mentioned about unusual forms of solidarity being forged between proletarianized Dalits and landed Jats. Uh, sorry, landed Jats. Can you please elaborate on the basis and nature of these links? Um, and there were a few other questions to, to that effect. So I think um, the, the nature of this alliance, and is it a kind of contingent alliance, um, as I think Jens put it, and I think there's a shade of difference in how um, perhaps. Uh, uh, Surinder talked about it um, as, as perhaps reflecting broader political economic trends, uh, that there might actually be more enduring forms of uh, uh, in interest, perhaps that's my interpretation, um, but all the panelists can elaborate on, on that. Um, then I think there's a few questions about kind of why this region um, and, and not others, why are, uh, you know, protesters in, in uh, why are farmers in Andhra Pradesh or Tamil Nadu not participating in the same way? How do differences, regional differences in agrarian political economy affect um, farmers and to the extent, and the question of whether these might coalesce into a broader kind of pan-India agrarian uh, movement. So that's sort of area two. Uh, there was one question I think I want to come to because it was one of the only ones about the laws themselves. Um, uh, CSC Shaker asks, are the fears that farmers would lose land to corporates valid given that uh, you know, the, the clause 8 and 15, the Contract Farming Act clearly outlaws this, your, your thoughts please. And so maybe that's also an invitation to uh, you know, anything else you would, you would like to say about um, perhaps whether the kind of analyses uh, that farmers are putting forward of these laws um, uh, uh, are valid. So I think those three areas, basically the kind of uh, rich farmer Dalit conflicts and potential uh, alliances, or what explains these alliances and um, how enduring they might be. Um, uh, the question, then the regional difference question and then the kind of laws question. So let me pose those three questions back to the panelists and they can also respond to anything they want to in, um, uh, in, in the other's presentations. Uh, let's go in the order that we, that we started with. So uh, Surrender, you could start. <coughs> Thank you very much. I think these are uh, some sense very important questions uh, because these are, uh, See, one should recognize that class is not a static category. Uh, class is also something which is very, what one should say, evolving reality. Uh, when we think of rich farmer, are there any rich farmers? And uh, how many of them are there? What would make them rich? Is it income? Is it ownership over land? Or is it their relationship with the Dalits? All these are very kind of uh, difficult categories because we have worked with these categories from a very different context where one could think of rural and agrarian independently of rest of the economy. I think the way Tindra talked about this rural urban binary does not exist any longer on ground. Uh, an average, for example, so-called rich farmer is not only a farmer, he is also some kind of trader diversified into other occupations, what Balgopal had long time back called the provincial property class. Uh, same is the case with the Dalit. I mean, Dalit is also, for example, the volume of employment available in agriculture is not enough for them to work only on agriculture. See, there are very few people who work as regular farm servants, but large majority of Dalits do not earn even 50% of their livelihood by working on land as landless laborers. They also are diversified. They have several other jobs and many of them actually very consciously have distanced themselves from, from rural and agrarian economy. They want to have their own enterprises or they prefer going working in the town as rickshapul. They continue to live in the village. And this is something which is coming out from many parts of India, particularly North India, 
my own studies in Haryana as well as in Punjab, but also from, from UP uh, uh, studies of Satendra and the Palanpur study. So wherever mobility has happened of the agrarian rich, it has happened through non-farm economy, not within the farm economy. Overall, farm economy has been declining, but this rich class of farmers, the so-called rich class of farmers, has become something else. It is in, invested in agriculture, but it is also invested in urban trade, urban businesses, and many, many other things. Another thing that has happened, which is very, very significant, and that links to the point that uh, Jens had made earlier, is the uh, overall marginalization of agriculture in the regional economy. In national economy also, it is it's very insignificant at some level, but even in the regional economy, regional political elite in Punjab, Haryana, Western UP, who used to be rich agrarian uh, kind of interests, uh, Punjab, you still have them, Haryana, you still have them to some extent, but they no longer see the source of their reproduction of their power in the village or in agriculture. They are diversified. They have different kinds of businesses. They have different kinds of sources of income. Their sources of legitimacy have also changed. So the rural power is no longer reproduced within the rural. There are kind of other official programs that come to the rural. So rural question of different communities and castes, it's only partly a class question. Partly it has also become an identity question. So Dalits are different because they are Dalits, right? Jats don't recognize them as, as equals and those problems still persist. Uh, they are separate Gurudwaras, there are conflicts, but those are questions which can be overcome through different kind of language. And that is why farmers in Punjab are very intelligently using the language of Sikhi. In Haryana, I think that would be difficult because they don't have that language available. Sikhi is something to which Dalits and Jats are both at some level committed and they see their space in them. So for example, Ravi Das, who is considered as, as Dalit Guru, his writing is there in, 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 in Guru Granth. So they identify with the language of Sikhi and that's how they're able to build a new kind of solidarity, which at some level is solidarity of identities and less a solidarity of classes, even though there's an element of class, but there's also a kind of solidarity of identities of caste around, around the question of Sikhi. I think they've, they've chosen this very intelligently. And music is another thing which is kind of, you know, bringing them together that, you know, they, they don't, they're not really talking about the word rural. They are only talking about, about Punjab, about region, about humanity, about, uh, to some extent, about, about Sikhi, but, but more importantly about agriculture. Agriculture means agriculture is Annadatta. They are the ones who are savior of, of um, and the related question is, is of, you know, regional differences that is very, very important because the support price regime is most effective in regions which produce uh, uh, wheat and paddy, and it has worked most effectively only in Punjab and Haryana to some extent in Western UP. Bihar doesn't have APMC, other regions, even though they have mandis, but those mandis don't work as effectively as they, as they worked in Punjab and Haryana. So there's, it's understandable that the farmers movement is stronger here, but I think as Satendra and Yens have both said, it is spreading. Initially, because it is still a lockdown period, trains are still not working. Karnataka, for example, has a very vibrant farmers movement. From day one, they have had kind of different kinds of uh, organizations. Maharashtra has had its own sit-ins, and there was a large number of farmers who landed in Bombay, and uh, there is a kind of uh, mobilization. But the many other areas, also government was able to, through its uh, what is called as the lapdog media, able to convey this message initially that this is a movement of Khalistanis because they brought their Sikhi symbols, that these are Khalistanis separatists and these people want to separate India from Punjab from India and that's why they are protesting. It has nothing to do with agriculture. And I think to some extent that message gone had gone, but it did not last for very long and they have been very successful in working that through Takaya, through other kind of media, but they have continued to use their language. It's not like they have given up the, on the language of, of, of Sikhi. So I think there are regional differences and agriculture is a regional context. Different regions have different kinds of agrarian questions unless they have a larger question because some regions, uh, it doesn't really matter. These laws really do not affect them much because they are, they are not producing paddy. They have never been sell, selling their produce in the mandis. So they have not been dependent on the state support price regime and therefore they don't see uh, much kind of in, 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 these, in these laws. Uh, there was another question about how uh, how these uh, these uh, apprehensions are valid. <coughs> 
see these are not stupid farmers i think this was also a narrative which was played very aggressively by the by the government that these people don't understand laws in, in fact first meeting where they went to attend the meeting with the government the only thing government was trying to do is to tell them how good they are and one of the minister gadkari said actually that you should prepare nice powerpoints and show it to them and they will understand so this is a complete misunderstanding these are not quote and quote those old kind of you know uh, illiterate peasants who don't know anything these are very very smart people and as as satendra was saying their children are lawyers and there are lots of people who are globally connected so they have the latest know how they know what exactly uh, different uh, 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 legal provisions would imply punjab farmers are also used to contract farming by the way it's not for the first time that they are using a uh, contract farming and they have actually suffered small farmers find it very difficult to deal with these companies where they have been given contract so obviously they may not lose land because corporate sectors can't even lease in land from farmers within the existing laws but given the way the farm laws are have been passed people don't trust indian democracy any longer so tomorrow they can bring out another law where it would be allowed so farmers have 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 apprehensions which are based on their own understanding and which is not far away from the reality of indian legal system or indian political system as it is functioning and they have analyzed each and every law in detail you talk to a young woman in punjab or old women in punjab she will tell you the details of it and how it is going to affect them and this is a very well informed i mean you may disagree that this is a wrong interpretation but it is a very well informed and well discussed position that most people have and they are speaking a language which is very different i have never heard that language being spoken by farmers so they are they are they are very well informed and they understand in my understanding they they actually uh, comprehend these things great yens thanks well i i, I think uh, surrender has dealt with the questions <laughs> so but uh, let me nevertheless add things here and there and let me start by the term class and uh, also with the question uh, agrarian question can that be agrarian question can that be agrar agrarian only and i, I think it's we every, everyone all all three of us have pointed out no that is not the case any longer that we actually can't think of class as as farmers anymore because uh, no, these categories simply don't exist on the ground and we as 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 academics i think have to uh, take the heat from that and and think differently and conceptualize differently that doesn't mean class doesn't exist but it means class look different and class differences therefore also look different and here i to me it is also very important therefore to think uh, uh, caste and class together because uh, uh, caste has always been used or any existing difference have always been utilized by business by capital and so is the case with class uh, with caste and we see that how dalits are getting the worst jobs outside of of agriculture as they had within agriculture oppression are being reinvented in new ways but it hits the same people and 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 that means that the different layers that exist in village the same differences we find outside uh, so class differences exist we just haven't got a term for it yet uh, that, that we all all agree on these different classes i i use the term classes of labor others use different term to 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 conceptualize this but classes still exist but it's different um, just a word on agrarian crisis i i think it's important there to distinguish between the sector the agricultural sector has growth rates that are not much different from what they were in the 70s uh, so so as a sector speaking you could say it's doing well uh, that doesn't mean that farmers are doing well uh, and to me thinking of that that is again why we can't think of 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 an agrarian question or in isolation for the rest of the country had there been jobs outside of agriculture we agriculture had not had to feed more and more people uh, so uh, the, the job of being a farmer didn't have to feed more and more people land sizes could be bigger etc the crisis in my view is cannot be understood as an agrarian crisis it is a crisis of of indian capitalism Uh, that that doesn't create livelihoods for people to the extent that is that is necessary 
Now, to, to then to, to actually go to the questions, uh, why do Dalit laborers then participate in, in these alliances? Well, when you listen to the organizations, they say we do this because uh, corporate agriculture will mean we, we will lose job in future. That is, that is, that is the that is what the leadership of, of different organizations say in Punjab and also the the Army. I mean, I suspect also that 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 they're pleased with the more radical agenda of much of the leadership of, of the movement, and they see they can fit in here. I, I it is also the case that that we shouldn't overestimate this. It's clear that that that. Uh, the Bima Army, for example, turned up with 100 people that uh, when uh, when Tikha had asked for help, and that was a great stunt that, that they could do so. But uh, it is not that it's from across North India that are rallying. It is the leadership that are that are trying to to get Dalits to see that this is something they can be part of more, maybe. Uh, and in, it, well, yeah, that certainly is is part of it too. I think. Uh, regional, of course, is, as 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 uh, as Surinder points out, this has a lot to do with whether uh, whether there are regulated markets or not, because the parts of the law isn't important for you if you haven't got these regulated markets. They are, of course, more widespread, and so is the procurement through through these markets uh, at, at 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 government prices. They are more spread out than they used to be. They used to be Punjab. Uh, and, and West UP really, and 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 it has been shown that now uh, in, in in both Madhya Pradesh and and and, and Orissa there's a, there's a good deal of procurement taking place as well as it has been decentralized. So so it's not that sort of strict northern as it may be looked to be. I think for this to become a broader more, uh, uh, movement, which I think it is becoming. Uh, uh, Farmers, I'm calling them farmers still, farmers uh, will join because they see this as an attack on the farming community and, and, and the, 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 the heavy handedness of, of, of the government plays a major role here, as does Rakesh Chikhaj, uh, the emotional uh, um, plea for support, uh, that I think that brought it home to many farmers that this is, this is a, 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 a struggle between farmers per se against government. Um, uh, uh, yes, and I think I'll stop there. I think uh, um, Surinder dealt with the, with, the, with the law question quite well. Great, Satendra. Yes, uh, well, um, uh, most of the things have been said before, uh, by Professor Jodhka and Yen, and uh, so I will uh, um, uh, try to highlight other things uh, like uh, in, uh, in context of Western UP, uh, one thing is quite interesting, uh, which I think uh, Ye and I are familiar with when he did field work, which has not been, I think, paid uh, attention. Like in Eastern UP, you see the Dalits have no land at all. But in Western UP, uh, Dalits, some of the families have land, they're land owning families. And it coincides very interesting with the rise of BSP in the, in the decade of two, uh, 2000. And, what has happened very interesting, two kind of dynamics has emerged very crisscross. One is that uh, on the one hand, Dalit and Jats had a very bitter, uh, bitter relations for a period of time. But also the two things happens. One, those who were the landless and moved to the uh, cities and they no longer have a relation with the Jats. So those or the uh, upper caste, so they have changed. New generation have a very different sort of a relationship. And the second thing, those who are the farmers, Dalit farmers, they also suffering and having the, uh, you know, the all problems with the Jat farmers are having. And that's the way this kind of a, uh, uh, alliances come together where, uh, you know, the Dalit start joining and not in wholesale, but also like leaders for, uh, 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 because of another, uh, here, another uh, line is here. So the, Near the struggle also shift uh, now, and uh, which is, needs to be also looked carefully. The rise of MBCs, which is a, a block of the OBC supporters, it's a very interesting. So they have been just above the uh, uh, Dalits. So the con conflicts are more with MBCs and Dalit instead of traditionally uh, they were more oppressed by the Jats. So that's also interesting how they, uh, the sometime Dalits are moving towards having uh, or looking for possible alliances with the Jats or Jat farmers or Gujars, which 
so it's a kind of a where the it's a very dynamic situation in the field like in books uh, books are written and they are always uh, take a lot of time to read it in but every day in the field situation change on where people are living so in 10 years the dynamics new generation come economic situation change and people rebuild their around or new alliances are emerge actually in this situation so it's a both uh, because the rise of mbcs also have implication of this jart dalit alliances that is interesting uh, uh, combination is emerging of course another thing i want to again highlight is this uh, uh, and you are all familiar with that ki why this idea uh, the class as yen was saying and uh, surender is also saying like how the class can be reconceptualized because in indian or uh, global south urban or industry has not able to absorb this surplus population was moving out from the rural and once they go to the city they can't even get the uh, a, a kind of a decent job they, their job are so uh, low and uh, insecure and that has continuously dependence on the rural uh, areas so rural urban are not just because of blood boundary because of the speed or cybernet this is one i have argued in somewhere but also more than that is the economic independence in which the, these boys or families they get ration from their villages the jobs are insecure in such a way that the jat families get ration even the wheat and and the pulses from their village and then they send money back to them so this sort of the this precariousness of the urban life has brought this uh, you know the, 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 the i think to challenge the category of class because here uh, you, you know the rural urban and the urban those who are working in urban lower class how they are uh, trying to collaborate and depending on the rural so here is a very interesting uh, i think uh, research and insight emerges about the class how to re rethink about it so this rural urban connections and uh, regional differences i think already very well said because every region like in western up it's a uh, sugarcane going uh, area so their pro, uh, 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 their grievances and uh, their uh, life is very different than punjab where you um, uh, grow paddy and wheat so sugarcane has its own risk and who can grow and their dues are not paid as every i think now is very public uh, everybody is talking about that 12000 crore are uh, due farmers have not paid for even last years so this whole uh, thing the regional differences are very important in, in mobilization one interesting thing i will say well which is like totally different from punjab western up bku and this farmer organization are not able to bring women together actually and so this list of black spot is here the mobilization of women has been done very successful in punjab and to extend there are also some successful cases in uh, haryana but so far uh, uh, very few women or young women have been only able to join this movement and there is no uh, very uh, sort of a, a coherent attempts to bring them in so patriarchy is still continue uh, 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 in this moment though there i am saying there is also attempt to bring them uh, and there is a young women who are working up, uh, 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 around this moment they are supporting they coming out but not as the uh, uh, punjab unions farmers movement and workers unions have done very well that so here uh, uh, i'll end mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is summarize a few uh, questions that that have come up um, that we haven't addressed uh, in as much depth. Um, the first is, you know, the implications of these protests for uh, Hindu right hegemony um, or the hegemony of the current regime. So, what is your assessment of that? Um, are the is the kind of heavy-handed response, the repression, the censorship? Um, is this a sign of uh, weakness or strength um is it is it too early to say uh what the political effects of these uh protests might be um then i think relatedly there was a series of questions about communalism and the extent to which these protests are transcending them or um uh consciously addressing um those tensions uh the interests of muslims in joining these protests so there's a cluster of questions around around that uh the another uh question um was about the role of left organizations 
uh, in these protests. Um, Surinder talked about them in Punjab, Yen's um, elsewhere uh, in, the, in the Maharashtra protest. Um, so say a bit more, uh, Tani wants you to say a bit more about the, the role uh, of left organizations in, in organizing, um, uh, uh, especially agricultural laborers uh, and Dalits and Adivasis. And I would sort of maybe add to that, ask you to consciously reflect on the, you know, the difference between this round of protests and the um, protests from a few years back centered in, in Maharashtra. Okay, so then uh, there's a question about the implications of this for PDS. Um, Jens, that was central to your kind of arguments. Um, so maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, then let's see, I think that um, there was a few questions about the, the Sikh idiom um, and the extent to which that kind of resonates uh, more broadly across uh, across uh, religious groups and, and regions. Um, but I think, I mean, Surinder's talked a lot about that, but if he has anything, if anyone wants to add to that. Um, and this this came up in, in, uh, in I think, particularly in Satendra and, and, and Surinder's comments, but, uh, you know, generation, um, you know, and maybe if, if there's anything more you want to say about this. So we're often here that young people aren't interested in farming and you've talked a lot about, um, uh, diversification and um, uh, uh, you know generational subdivision and and, and so on uh, and, and urbanization. But do you want to say more about um, how you make sense of the participation of of many young people in these protests? Um, are these uh, is it on behalf of their families um, or or their uh, you know should we conclude that there are actually young people that want to keep farming? Um, and I think obviously this relates to the question of jobs. Um, that's come up in all of your presentations. Okay, so I think this might be the last round. I'm just, let me just scan if there's anything else um, I can add here. Uh, if the panelists wanna look through briefly and see <laughs> if there's anything they wanna address. Um, I know this, we've not been able to cover everything, but I think if you respond to those major areas that would cover Kind of a lot of the ground that that's coming up in the um in the questions and i apologize to the participants if we didn't um get to all of your specific questions okay so why don't you let's let's yeah, do one uh, more <clears throat> i can uh, start uh, i think this question of uh, the hindu right hegemony uh, of course we don't really know i think we'll have to wait and it's too early to say but one way to respond would be to again go to the punjab case uh, and I think there has been this anxiety building up in Punjab for quite some time that the rise of Hindutva is threatening our identity. And I think that is something which kind of coalesced very well with the farmer's anger. So I don't think it was accidental. It was something that, you know, because Sikh farmers happened to be Sikhs that they brought Sikhi along and they continue to use the Sikhi idiom. So I think this was a very well thought out, well consciously thought out uh, way that we would present our own identity in our own language and language, not simply Punjabi language, but also the idiom of Sikhi as a regional culture, as a counter Hindu culture. And counter Hindu culture has been done very, very confidently. And if you look at... Uh, it's not only the farmers who are mobilized, it's the, 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 the Sikh community globally mobilized. And I think this also at some level relates to the point about Maharashtra, the Sikhs have resources. And these resources are mobilized from everywhere, wherever they are, from California, from Vancouver, from Australia, uh, uh, Khalsa aid comes immediately there and it tries to kind of provide. So they are able to sustain these movements because to begin with, all the resources, almost all the resources came from the Punjabi Sikhs and later on majorly from Haryana. Haryana has been supplying in, in a large scale. So one should recognize that these are relatively prosperous farmers compared to Maharashtra farmers who were actually more poor and uh, less resourceful and they needed some level outsider support to, to even reach Bombay. But these are self-led farmers. And I think this is uh, very similar to what 1980 was. But I think what Satinder was saying that we also need to reimagining land and farm identities. And land and farm identities are not only farming identities, 
they stick to you wherever you go and the kind of loyalty i have seen people have traveled from canada just to be with farmers for a day during pandemic and then they go back and the punjabi singers the way they have kind of you know got mobilized globally again lots of these punjabi singers are actually canada based already there are nearly 200 songs which have been composed on farmers movement some of them have been composed there right at the farmer site some of them in punjab some of them in other sites but all of them them kind of the, the the visuals are very very interesting visuals are very positive visuals are very green visuals are very uh, in some sense always saying asi jitange we will win we will win not even once they have said that we will struggle they'll say we will win only thing you need is that you need equal you need unity and you need patience perseverance and this is something which is amazing i mean i've not even once i've heard face that which is depressed and says that yeah and there was a time when one farmers movement rajewal tried to argue with them that you should kind of down uh, size your sikhi idiom and next day he was given lectures by everyone do you think you'll be able to sustain it just as farmers movement it is only because because we are with you and you are able to sustain it don't think that all these resources will come to you simply because of agriculture these resources are coming to you because you are representing a larger cultural politics and this cultural politics at some level also is one way of responding to the to the hindu hindutva questions or the the right wing hegemony question and this is how i think it would come it cannot come purely in secular language it would come from regional cultures and i think that has happened very very successfully and i think thinking about farming identity and the way people connect to land not only because they need to go back to 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 the village to get their ration for the month but they go back to the village to get their substantive identity they get married in the village so they connect you live in canada but your child will go to punjab even if you are married in in canada but your identity is there your gurudwara is there and you would connect it so land connection goes very far and i think this is something which on which i think agrarian studies have not really worked as much as we ought to work so urbanization somehow has been seen as that we'll forget the rural so i think that is something which which kind of you know uh, needs to be stretched and imagined and thought and conceptualized uh, in a much more kind of uh, different way in a kind of culture way rather than in economy way or class way and that something which kind of uh, uh, left organizations i think uh, uh, others can take up so i Ian's, would you like to go? I'll happily go. Um, so maybe so one of the things that Satendra said was uh, uh, how the BJP JAT alliance in in the two thousands could work out among other things because the the young JATs in the in the cities uh, were were looking they were buying into this this dream of of jobs and. Um, smart life and 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 that was also what what the what the bjp sold them and and likewise i think that the reason why it's it's breaking down while they're broken with the with the with the hindu right hegemonic forces now is because they have not realized the forces that uh, the way capitalism is developing in the global south is not from any longer from rural to urban from farmers to workers it is much more complicated there one cannot take this model and expect that to to take place in the global south so therefore identities affinities class relations are different and and therefore it is possible to have alliances across from agriculture to urban areas because to a large extent we're talking about the same the same people being in both places belonging to same classes um, so um, uh, to me that means that 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 uh, th this can potentially have huge impacts for the he hegemony of the hindu right if it if it if if the if the farmers succeed and want to maintain uh, and and an oppositional stand to the present government uh, i think that is that is something totally new and 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 changes the opposition to the government dramatically uh, we will have to see whether the government realizes this and will do something about it but but as it stands now it is i, I think that is this is a bit of a turning point um so uh, and so that is to answer it in a, in a very 
a general way. Um, now, uh, left organizations, well, yes, I mean, it, it is interesting to see how uh, 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 organizations such as the All Indian Kisan Sabha and other organizations involved in, in Maharashtra clearly drew on a, on a different way of thinking about farmers to, to the idea of of potentially well farmers that are better off than than others are better than others this was more about class alliances it was drawing in marginal farmers laborers adivasis something that's that that it is a new generation of politics uh, yes it is left but it is not uh, left as we knew it it is it is it is it is a different way of thinking that Things along class and, and identity and, and and social oppression in the, in a much more holistic way and and, and I think have done so. Uh, for, I I'm a I'm a I'm an outsider looking in, but to me it looks it looks impressive. It is also interesting to see at the same time that uh, that the Dalit movements, uh, while they of course are in part Ambedkarite movements, they are also leftist movements. They, 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 their analysis are uh, a, a drawing on Marxism, on political economy in a manner that, that, that unites those two strands in a, in a way that, for example, the, the BSP would never do. Uh, so, so there are convergences, there are of course differences, but there are also convergences within these movements that, 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 that will be interesting to watch. Uh, PDS, uh, so the, the public distribution system in India, the the the, the ration system, the, the 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 supply of of of, uh, of uh, subsidized or free uh, grains uh, and a few other things. To to uh, a, a recent article put it down to an estimate of 66 percent of the population. Um, uh, Will will that be threatened by this? Well, uh, the the argument that it would be goes if 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 the if the regulated if the regulated markets are threatened, uh, if the minimum support price is threatened, then it will be very difficult uh, to maintain the, the 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 procurement that is necessary to run the public distribution system. And while there's nothing in the laws that says that the minimum support price will go, there's nothing in the laws that says that this will have any implications for PDS, that is a fear that it could have um, uh, along that line of thinking. Uh, and, and sadly, I mean, it, is, it is well known that well known that the present government would rather go down the cash transfer route than, than the PDS route. So uh, I think if, if the present government could do as it wanted to, it would be happy to rethink uh, uh, those kind of issues as well. They are not in a position to do it right now, but, but, but that, is, that, that is a perspective that, that, that's, that can come up. Great, Satendra. Yeah, so I would say, I would add to, the, add to this very uh, uh, already said uh, couple of things. See, when you're talking about the Hindu right and hegemony, one thing in democracy, we need to little bit pay attention to how political parties uh, organize themselves. So it's not just voter here, it's a mobilization. Mobilization, I think the farmer movement has been able to bring different segments and sections and classes together, I think very, uh, very strongly, and that is visible. But the point will be in the future also how political party acts and how the uh, opposition leaders capitalize on uh, it. So that will be one way of articulating how they will challenge it. Second thing, of course, uh, like as uh, in Punjab case, uh, uh, Prof. Jodhga has pointed out, the Sikhi has been one of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the kind of uh, uh, pivot where uh, all uh, movement is uh, revolving around. In Western UP also, there is a very interesting thing. Jat's uh, identity, they are reclaiming the Jat identity one way, uh, and also they're not ashamed of it, of course, but also interestingly, they're claiming of the farmer's identity again. And that once they started claiming farmer's identity, that is helping them bringing other, as I've already pointed out uh, in, in detail, how they're bringing, able to bring together 
the sec uh, the section of society you know across re uh, religion and the caste group which were were not before there and as yen has also pointed out the same thing i will say again the rural urban this job hold hold the hopes of the jobs which were uh, given in the uh, 2000 and there was a whole, whole uh, dream aspiration was put together like okay well, you will get the jobs but there are no jobs where you will go so of course there is a enough enough uh, force has been developed you know but it also will depend whether how it will materialize in democracy they will depend on opposition political parties leadership and also since bjp has been a very very astute and that's a skill they have developed they pit against you know the groups caste group against each other so that will be the another challenge and that's why the demand of ballot uh, returning to the ballot box has been a very strong and very valid demand so it's not just the farmers i think the whole electoral system has to be uh, has to understood and, and and think through whether evm uh, what's the role of evm and uh, how the ballot box is uh, has to come back a section of demanding it so i would say this is uh, one set of the things about the hindu hegemony and claiming of the caste identities and and you know across religions so second uh, communalization this is very interesting and which i have uh, pointed out before in my writing also how why muslims are coming back and it's a uh, why why they want to join the farmers movement see uh, i mean I'm only i will talk about the western up context uh, as uh, uh, yen is familiar with that western up very well uh, you know rural and urban almost presence of muslim around uh, 28% to 30% or uh, 20 uh, 26 to uh, 34% if you go rural and urban so and majority of them the uh, the pasmanda or lower caste uh, and they uh, they have a lot of other uh, there are some of the farmers, uh, some of them associated with the farming communities, and they're living in rural areas. So how you live in everyday life? Because uh, there was a relationship between uh, uh, jat farmers and, and the artisan caste groups. And these artisan caste group was the kind of backbone of these uh, farmers. But now, agree, and also artisan and labor caste groups, since the 2013, the acrimony and also this uh, social fabric was torn apart, and, uh, torn apart, and then people were so scared of each other. And you know, soon within two, three, four years, uh, across communities, realize everyday reality was so like people could not go on the roads or in their fields in night. But there was fear either this community will kill us or that community will kill us. And that was a, like a railing point. People started coming together and asking, hey, look, we should restore this faith because we have to live. How many people will leave the villages? Because the, everybody has to go to the field in the night to, uh, to, uh, for irrigation or some field or, you know, there is no, you can't confine to home and there is no police. So that kind of everyday reality, this emerged around it. Look, we should uh, try to bring people together and create a peace. Second was the labor. Jat farmers uh, need a labor. And once they started withdrawing, this was very difficult to find labor because Dalits are already moving out. And now Muslims are also moving out. So who will provide labor? And Jat son have go gone to the uh, Delhi to do work. So who will do? Only one person left in family, two person left family is impossible to carry out the agriculture work. So this everyday reality is actually not only one side, it's a both sides. Actually, it's not. I'm not saying only Jat needed the Muslims, but also Muslim needed the farmers or the the sort of everyday requirement need brought them together. This is and that is the attempts are going on. It's not like it's spontaneous. There, uh, there are leaders, community leaders in villages. They are trying to convince people and they're trying to pacify. Their active movement is going on. Okay, look, we have to live together. We can't run away from this uh, uh, land. So that is also, I think, the, the where the Muslims is not joining. I think they are happily joining. They are even making this point, look, we want to participate. We want to uh, live together in this society. And it's good when the, uh, the, the many uh, Muslim leaders pointed out, look, Jats uh, were participating in riots. So there was no resistance. They accepted it and they, they listened to them and they did not 
uh, hooting them. They didn't do anything. They, they, they listened and they said this was our mistake. And now openly Jats are accepting it was our mistake to give uh, support the BJP. And that's a very interesting part actually. Accepting publicly. So, and the last, uh, I would say youth. Yes, and as uh, Professor Jodhka has already pointed out, youth, yes, uh, the one sense is the family. I mean, then you, uh, I mean, when you talk about the youth in South Asia or global South, one need to look at also very, uh, I mean, interestingly, families play very important, like uh, youth in uh, global North have a very different life trajectory. And they're more governed by the youth subcultures. But if you live in India, in South Asia, even you get a 40 year old is still you are so attached with your parents. So of course, there they, you have to fight with your family is a very interesting you, you sleep still you're, you're with your father, like they, they share the same, you know, space and sit chat. So masculinity are not that. So the, the trajectory when you talk about the youth and their affiliation, the families are very interesting. They're, they're, uh, their uh, wives and husband are decided by their parents actually here. Yeah. So very different affiliation is there. And then of course, so, uh, they support the movement on the, but also land, the identity as I've also pre pre previously pointed out. And the, the, the land is very interesting because it gives psychological security also, not only economy, economic is there, but in the fragile urban economies where they're not able to get the job, Land is a security and also identity, respectful identity with dignity, which is a history, history of dignity. What is the farmers to be? I think I end it here. So hopefully, you know, I answered, but I, because Amita has already signaled, we have to end, wind up. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, I thought those were three great uh, presentations and the discussion was fantastic. And um, so first I want to just, um, I want to point out that a that uh, I think we are walking away understanding a lot more about the current rounds of uh, the character of the the ongoing protests and the context in which they're occurring, um, and I also think that this discussion indicates how far agrarian political economy has come from the '90s and how much the sort of old terms of that debate have kind of been, you know, bypassed uh, and transcended with much more interesting analyses. Um, so uh, I applaud our, our panelists and want to thank them um, again. And we look forward to their uh, written contributions, versions of this, which we're hoping to put out in the Journal of Peasant Studies uh, in an expedited um, manner. I want to thank all the participants for the great questions and, and, and sorry that we can individually uh, address all of them. And I hope that everyone can come tomorrow to the second panel in this forum on markets, globalization, uh, and ecology, which will also be fantastic. Uh, finally, I want to thank the IT team at Ashoka for uh, helping us put this together. And I don't know if Amita wants to say anything else. Otherwise, we will um, wrap up. We'll see you all tomorrow. And uh, thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Mike. Thanks, Amita. Thank Thanks you. to all. Bye bye. See you. I have been the mess. Please forgive me. There was, yeah. a, so glad it worked. There was a digital India perfect example. You can see <laughs> how we will work in future. <laughs> see you tomorrow, everyone. Bye bye. See you. See you.